As I was meditating on this service, and I, I woke up again in the, in the night thinking, and these thoughts that, that dawned upon me, I've had probably two very strong mentors, if you will, as far as impartation in ministry. I think we can all identify who those people might be in our lives, but two very strong, and one of those would be, of course, Dr. T.L. Osborne, Daisy had already passed on, and um, Brother Kenneth Hagen, Sr., Papa Hagen. And I've been, we, ha we have the opportunity to travel so many places and to see so many churches and to talk with so many leaders. I am often astonished, not astonished, I'm often taken aback, perhaps, astonished might be a little too strong, that I would hear a pastor say, well, we've got to return to the basics, Isaiah 53, Matthew 8, 17, and 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, which simply are things that I heard in Bible school, and I've preached all over the world. I, I doubt that I haven't preached it in 65 nations of the earth, which is simply, he died on the cross, he bore my sins, he took my sicknesses and my diseases, that he was punished so that I might have peace, and that Matthew walked in that hour in Matthew 8, verse 17, he recorded, hey, hey, hey this is what the prophet Isaiah was talking about. <laughs> you know, here he is. And then Peter, looking back to the cross, and I'm paraphrasing scriptures, I hope you'll permit that. But Peter, looking back to the scripture, or back to the cross in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, understanding that this Jesus is the bishop of our souls, but this Jesus is the one who has saved us, redeemed us, and by his stripes, we were healed. Looking back. And so these concepts that are so absolutely central to the identity of who we are in Christ. They, they guide us. They outline our future. They strengthen us. They undergird us. And they keep us aware of the presence of God in our lives. So I don't consider these fundamentals that we need to return to. I consider them essentials that are a part of who we are. Because if they are not essentials to our daily life, then we're just like any other religion. Brother, I'm going to take this a little warm for this. <laughs> yes, dear, thank you so much. Um, Dr. T.L. Osborne used to always say this. He'd say, most people spend most of their time praying for two things. The first way they spend their time praying is asking God to do what he's already done. Heal me, oh God. Save me, O oh God. Deliver me, O oh God. When in actuality, we look back to the cross 2,000 years ago and we acknowledge the work that Jesus Christ has already done. And so we take a step before that cross and we receive what belongs to us. So it's no longer a begging of what we need from God. It is a stepping into what belongs to us that is of God and now ours. I remember, a, actually this detail is not in my notes, but I'm going to go with the inspiration of that if you don't mind. <laughs> I remember we were in a city called, um, I believe it was, per, it was Bashkartostan. That's where it was, Bashkartostan. Maybe it was Izjask in Russia. And I had been doing a healing school all week. We had our large tent up in the city, and thousands of people had been healed and delivered. And there was a little babushka, which means grandmother in Russian. And this babushka came up to me. At the end of this week, she'd been to every service in the evening, all the healing services, been to everything. And she walks up to the platform about this high, stomping her feet, and she's angry. She looks at me and she said, I've been to every meeting and I'm not healed. <laughs> Heal me. Like, you do something about this. And I remember I just looked at her and I said, Grandma, when were you healed? No, I said, Grandma, what will happen if I lay my hands on you? Well, well, I don't know. Whatever the Lord wants. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, Grandma, when were you healed? Uh, I don't know. And there was a big cross on the back of the platform, and the platform is a little deeper than this one. And I marched back to that cross, 
And I stood back here, and I'm shouting now at Grandma. And she actually had a crucifix on her neck. neck. She was a nice, orthodox grandma. Probably one of the praying grandmas that caused all the missionaries and the wall, the missionaries to arrive and the wall to come down. But I'm, so I'm yelling at her, I say, hey, Grandma, when were you healed? Still looking at me. I said, when did Jesus go to the cross? I don't need a microphone, do I? <laughs> when did Jesus go to the cross? Uh, 2,000 years ago? I said, Grandma, when did he take your sickness and disease? Uh, 2,000 years ago? And I began marching out to the front of the platform. I said, so if he took all of your sickness and your disease, 2,000, she says, I'm healed, I'm healed. You don't have to pray for me. I'm healed. He took it 2,000 years ago. And Grandma took off running because she connected with the concept. And that is our living for Christ is connecting with the redemptive concepts that make us different than any other religion. If, Jesus, if Kevin had had time, he would have shared with you, I believe he shares five points, that what makes our faith or our Jesus unique. Our Jesus stands alone among all philosophers, among all nations, among all religions, in that not only did our Messiah, our leader, our religious leader, if you will, come back from the dead. He came back from the dead and he appeared to his disciples for a period of 40 days. And he was seen by what? Around 500? Yes. Not only did our Messiah, and you see, we talked about this back there last night a little bit. <laughs> He was seen. It's proven. It's a reality. It is not a myth. It is not a fable. It is not a book crafted by those who wanted to just write a cool story like all of these fantasy mysteries that they have out there through the games and in books today. No. History confirms that it's a reality and that it actually happened. So our Jesus, having risen from the dead, he now speaks to us from beyond the grave because he has risen from the dead. And as the one who has risen from the dead, he now talks to us. And not only does he talk to us, he lives in us. And therefore, he talks through us. Every other leader of every other religion is still dead in that grave. Their bones can be found. But ours is alive. Buddha, Socrates, Aristotle, Mohammed, Put a name on whomever you like. The reality is they can't find Jesus because Jesus is not to be found. He is alive and risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And not only, you know, that the other thing that T.L. would always say, if you've ever seen Jesus, you will never be the same. If you've ever, Hattie Hadsburg, Dr. T.L. Osborne heard that message from Hattie Hadsburg right before Jesus appeared to him. And until that point, Dr. T.L. Osborne was known as a popular preacher. He could raise money. The Pentecostals were putting him in charge of the whole denomination up and down the west coast of the United States of America. He stepped into that pulpit and things would happen. No, not supernatural healings and miracles, but people would give money. People would engage. He said, but if they brought somebody demon-possessed into the church and they'd lay them on the floor, we'd pick up that big Bible and we'd lay that Bible on top of them and we'd stand back and scream because we didn't know that that person could be simply delivered by and through the name of Jesus. But after that encounter that T.L. Osborne had with Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he now knew it was no longer a Christian religion, but it was a relationship with the almighty living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, having said that, as a church, what are the fundamentals that we must return to? Are we a church, and I'm not saying of this church, are we a church globally in general that we have 
put up our walls, established our fences. It's like our schools anymore. Because of the fear of what might happen within our schools, there are fences, tall fences. There are security guards. There are lines. There are checks on automobiles prior to people coming on to drop off their children. All because of a fear and a mentality of the bunker in, a bet in the middle of a war. We must crawl into the bunker for fear. And it's real out there in the world. But as Christians, what are we carrying to the world? And what do we possess today in our churches? We're not building fortresses. We're building hospitals. And the front door of our churches must be the emergency ward where we are rather, rather ready to gather and to collect and to bring in every addict, every sex-addicted individual, every person who does not know whether they are male or female. Every person can be rescued and can be brought by any person at any time into the midst of the congregation because this is the hospital of the Lord Jesus Christ where 2,000 years ago he paid the price for every person who would walk through the doors of any church anywhere. Amen? Are we a hospital or are we a fortress? Are we a castle or are we a palace of his love and his glory? Praise the Lord. So as we were talking last night, so, two things that Brother Osborne always said. Number one, most people, this is, he, he defined this as religion. Most people spend most of their time asking God to do what he's already done. Not in here, of course, but this information will help you to help other Christians. And then they spend the rest of their time asking God to do what he already told us to do. Lord, save your people. Lord, heal your people. Lord, go get your people. Bring them into the church, Lord. You know the old saying? People will say, we want to move of God. The question rather that we should ask is, <laughs> God's moving, but maybe you aren't. When you move, God moves because he dwells in you. Amen. Are we waiting on a move of God or have we become the move of God in the earth? The choice is ours. And how will the church respond to the call? For when Jesus looked out into those harvest fields in Matthew chapter 9, if you read through verses, what, 36 through 38, back up to 35, and he, here Jesus had been everywhere, it said. Healing and everyone that he, he, he was around, the lame, the deaf, everyone was being healed. Their lives were being transformed and the crowds were following him. <laughs> and it's interesting to me that at the very end of that passage, it's as if Jesus was standing up as one, alone, no help, and the multitudes were hurting and he stood there, and then at the end of the chapter, he said, he looked out on to the fields or the people, and they were bruised and battered like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said, build the church. You want to flip that scripture up there, 37, 38? Oh, you got it, 36. And then he said, build the church. What does the scripture say? And then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Verse 38, therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. Do you understand that the great shepherd saw the sheep bruised, battered, worn, and weary. He walked among the multitudes that were crying out for help. 
out among the multitudes crying for help. The multitudes are all over Central Florida. And people say, well, I can't share my faith. They'll shut me down. Oh, really? Well, 1980, the something shopping center, I don't have it in my notes today, but there was a Supreme Court case won where a shopping center stopped individuals for sharing literature. Privately owned shopping center with public business. That Supreme Court decision ruled in favor of the people to have free access to distribute any public literature on any shopping center. That is a Supreme Court decision. So when they try to drive you out of these public shopping centers, I need to find that and give you that Supreme Court ruling. But when they try to drive you out, you just pull up that ruling and you say, look, the Supreme Court ruled in favor and said any publicly, any privately owned property, because that's what they'll say, this is private property, you can't do that. But any private property owned or that has conducts public business where people, the First Amendment defines, de, defines, not defines, protects your right to make your opinion known on that piece of property. Now, you don't have the right to um, stand in front of their doorways and prevent them from earning money for the purposes that they're there, but you have the right to be there. And that is a case, a Supreme Court case. It was one, it's a shop, it's da-da-da-da-da shopping center, I believe 1981, out in Southern California. California. So, what is our church today? And so this shepherd, this great shepherd, Jesus, whom, according to Ephesians chapter 4, he's given gifts. And those gifts are the gifts, what, the pastor, the apostle, the the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist. He has given all of these gifts. To whom? To the harvest. It's not just the evangelist that is the harvester. It's all of us. Even Paul told Timothy to do the work of the evangelist. Now, I haven't brought all my scriptures where I can run you through everything all the scriptures that confirm that every believer is to be witnessing, but Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, John chapter 20, and in Luke, is it Luke 26? Have I got that right? All of those scriptures tell us, tell every individual that we are to go forth in his power, with his love, in his demonstration, Anyone sins, you forgive, it says in John chapter 20, will be forgiven. <gasps> Me? Forgive sins? Absolutely. Why? Because you take him to Jesus, the place of forgiveness, and you are the doorway. If any man walk through that door, your door, your life, your opportunity, you shall lead them to him. And they shall be forgiven. They shall be healed. They shall be saved in Jesus' name. But that's your authority. Jesus is seated in heaven. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we're not begging God to do what he told us to do. Or do to do. We're not begging him to do what he told us to do. We are obeying what he said to do 2,000 years ago. For the fields are white unto harvest. When we first began to travel with Dr. T.L. Osborne, you know, even missionaries can get kind of prideful. You know, hey, we forsook all. We moved to Russia. Do you have any idea what it was like to live in Russia? There were food lines. There was no food. I'm telling you, when they found out you got food over there in the Producti, you'd get on the telephone. Not a cell phone, but you'd have to find a telephone. And then you had all your ways. You know, it's like in Africa, man. You go to Africa, and you got to move a meeting in two days. And somehow in two days, the whole nation knows that you moved across town. <laughs> There's such an amazing communication network in Africa. You know, but the, the Westerners, now we have cell phones, so we're pretty good at it. But Westerners, you know, the, oh, 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 how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to shift a meeting? How are we going to make this happen? But there in Russia, we would be, you know, long food lines. So we'd call, oh my gosh, they brought in some chickens from Holland. We have chicken. And I'm every missionary in that region would be in that line with everybody else with their little bag to get some chicken. 
You know, so, so you get to this place and you, oh, you're paying a price. You know, you're paying a price. We've all been there. You're paying a price to serve God, to do something. So I would ask Dr. T.L. Osborne, because I knew there was something I was missing. Dr. T.L., I would ask him, what, what is a missionary or what are mission? What is missions? What is the heart, the core of missions? He wouldn't answer me for a long time because I'm quite sure he saw in my spine that weave of pride. You know, I'm over here serving Jesus as a missionary. And I can speak Russian too, you know. And uh, finally, after a season, he wrote it down on a little sticky note and he handed it to me. And it was actually when we were back here in America. And he wrote on that sticky note, Missions <laughs> is when every believer is witnessing for Jesus Christ. Every believer is witnessing for Jesus Christ. We would travel to these nations and people always wanted us to gather the leaders and the pastors because the famous Dr. T.L. Osborne was coming. And Dr. T.L. would say, I don't want any pastors and leaders especially if they have gray hair. He said, because they're already set in their ways and they're, they don't want to think a new thought. They're already thinking their thoughts and they're ingrained. It's like a habit, a rhythm. It's like the ruts in an old dirt road. Those ruts get deeper and deeper and deeper. So he'd say, give me the Bible school students. Give me the young people. Fill up that place with people who will hatch off like a chicken that's being hatched out of an egg, and they'll catch an idea from heaven, and they will go out, and they will be this witness for Jesus Christ. See, that was the foundation. Don't ask God to do what he's already told us to do. We are his witnesses. Amen? I remember... Uh, I grew up in the Baptist church, so you can imagine, in America, if you grow up in the Southern Baptist church, women don't preach. So it was quite an oddity for me to hear a call of God and to actually have an open vision. Even well long, long before I met Kevin, I had an open vision of, the ma of mass evangelism. I didn't know what mass evangelism was, <laughs> but I was standing on a platform and I had a microphone, and I was in an unusual dress on that platform, and then the microphone would turn into a loaf of bread, and I would break off the loaf of bread, and I would hand bread down. And hands were up in every direction as far as I could see. I had no idea what that meant until I saw the front of Reinhard Bonnke's book. He had just released it, Plundering Hell to Populate Heaven. When I saw the cover, I went, oh, that's what I saw in that vision, in that dream. But you know what, what touched me? That was actually later as I was getting ready for Bible college. But what, and this is where I want to transition now a little bit over to Papa Hagen. Because the first books that came into my hand, those 50 cent books that came into my hand, after as a young Baptist woman, you see, I was hungry. Baptist, we study the word. But then we come to a point where we get, where's the more? I wanted more. I mean, I was a very busy business person, and so for me to come to church and sit there with all the clientele lists that I had and the, the, the activities that I must engage with in the community and come to church and leave and feel like, man, they just took stuff out of me. You know, what's going on? And so I got hungry for God. I went to the Presbyterian church. I went to the Catholic church. I went to the every ch Episcopalian church, what? Looking for more of God. And there across the street from where my apartment was, was a little strip mall. And I got invited to a luncheon at the yacht club. Wonderful for a banker. There's money in yacht clubs. So I'll go to the luncheon at the yacht club. Is this okay to share a little story with you? I don't know when I'm supposed to finish. When am I supposed to finish? No, no, there's somebody after me. Okay, well, somebody let me know. Okay, you'll let me know. Okay. Anyway, I'm at that luncheon, and um, I have my Baptist Bible. And the, there was a woman preaching that day, and she was preaching on 
Why tongues today? Now, you've got to understand, there are 300 people in this Ugali Yacht Club. It's over in Melbourne, Florida, luncheon. 300 women and business people. And she begins speaking on why tongues today. She preached that entire message, and when she finished, I looked down at my Bible, and my Bible said, why no tongues written in pencil as a good Baptist, why there are no tongues today. And I said, well, Lord, she has a great case for this. I'll go home and study it out. And then the woman spoke and said, there's a young woman out there you just said to the Lord. I'm going to go home and study this out. She says, I'm here today to tell you this is what you've been looking for. And that began a revolution in my life. I no law, now I knew God had a voice. I could hear him. He knew my heart. He wanted to find me. He wanted to help me. Well, I didn't speak in tongues that day. My Baptist brain was, you know, hanging on to probably too much. But eventually they told me. This is how serious I was, though. They told me now that they had prayed for me and I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, I needed to pray an hour every day in tongues. So I got up extra early before I would go to work, and I knelt down beside my bed, and I put the alarm clock on the bed, and I began to pray. Deca, 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 deca. That's all I had. Deca, deca. And it felt just like that deca, deca. So after five minutes, I moved the clock to the side, and I said, this can't be it. <laughs> this can't be it. This is wasting my time. Deca, deca, deca. I feel like I'm build, burying a, you know, a, I think in Russian sometimes I'm, I'm digging a hole and I'm, clock, I'm, I'm getting into the hole. Well, not long after that one weekend, I was listening to a truth, an old truth album, Baptist singing in my apartment on my back on the floor. And I was just singing and all of a sudden this language came out of me. And I'll tell you to this day, I reached out to touch and I felt like I was levitating in that room. There was such a bright light in that room and I couldn't touch anything. I wasn't aware of where I was. And he reached into my world. Not the first time. He's done it many times and revolutionized my life. My second mentor, his name was Brother Kenneth Hagin. And his cry before he went to heaven for the church was, will we lose the move of the Holy Ghost? Will the church, 10 minutes left, oh, we're in serious trouble. <laughs> I haven't even touched on. <laughs> will we miss and lose the move of the Holy Ghost? Folks, there is nothing more precious than this intimate, personal gift that we have of praying in other tongues. I wrote down several examples today that I wanted to share with you. And Matthew, and I'll just read a few things, and I can't really tell you the stories because we're already out of time. But I had the privilege, when I went to Bible college, I got to sit under Kenneth Hagin. Now, I'm not, we're not typical Rhema people because we didn't go through their whole system. We've, we're evangelists. You know, they're about kind of, we're, we're the Osborne maybe look on things. But I learned, I sat under Brother Reagan. God sent a business man into my world and paid for all of my Bible education, my car, my rent, my insurance, my groceries. And God did it because he knew what a hard worker I was so that I would sit and I would listen. And I sat with on prayer school and healing school. I sat under Brother Hagen every day and did not miss one of those prayer school encounters with God. Now, little did I know, and I share this today because of Lake Mary needs you. And you know these principles. Lake Mary needs you. And as I'll say it again, you know these things by the Spirit. But you can lead in these things in a new way, in a greater dynamic, in a greater dimension. Like Mary needs these things. Daytona needs these things. And the other cities that are represented. I would sit there as he would conduct healing school. 
And I had purpose, no, prayer school. And I had purposed in my heart <laughs> not to meditate in the word. If he said pray in the spirit, I obeyed everything he said. You know, because you'll go to a prayer meeting and they'll say pray in the spirit and you'll look out there and 95% of the people are just sitting there <laughs> reading the word of God. No, that's not what he asked you to do. He said pray in other tongues. Pull up together with me and labor with me in the spirit because our prayer track is equal to our success track because we are pulling out of the heavenly realms the divine vision, the wisdom, and the plan of God for manifestation in the earth around us, including our communities and our nations. And you have a role to play. You know, speaking of storms, uh, we have a weekly prayer group that we conduct when we're in the country. And it's a small group, and that's okay, because these are people that know how to pray, and I've trained, we've trained them, I've trained them. And uh, do you remember Hurricane Irma, Irma? Do you remember Irma? Well, we called it Irma, because Irma is a name from the Baltics, Scandinavia, and certain parts of Eastern Europe. So all of our teams over there understood that Irma had come to disrupt a historic meeting that we had set in Scandinavia, where we had representatives coming from 30 nations, tickets already purchased, the meetings already set up, and it was called East Meets West where the Russians were hooking forces with all of these nations in Europe to bring in their tents and to continue this move of evangelism. Well, our teams over there, they're like, this Irma is from the devil. Well, we know these storms are from the devil anyway, but they're like, this is a specific attack, attack against Kevin and Leslie McNulty and what God wants to do in Europe. I'm like, amen, pray. <laughs> but I remember that just a few days before the storm, it might have been the Thursday before the storm, we were in a prayer meeting, not many more people than this. And all of a sudden, and I learned this from Brother Hagen. This is what I want to bring to our attention. All of a sudden, and you all know this, but we cannot forget these things. All of a sudden, that great grieving, that great travail of the Spirit came. And I found myself calling the whole group to enter in to pray in other tongues. Somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, I was in that travail. And then all of a sudden, I had a release. And I heard the Lord say this. No, I didn't hear. I just had this, this love, like liquid love that poured out of me. And I said, oh, God, wrap your arms around the Bahamas. You love the Bahamas. And I say that now in the name of Jesus. Storm, be gone from the Bahamas. Go out to the sea in the name of Jesus. And then as I sat there, as soon as I said that, then I heard, is this okay I share this with you? Yes. Yeah? All of a sudden I heard these words, rebuke the spirit of witchcraft that has called Irma in through the port of Miami. Wow. I'm like, I don't walk around binding things and, you know, speaking to spirits all. I mean, I do when necessary, but I'm not one of these people that's looking for a devil behind every wall. You know, that's teaching you 15 items on how to defeat the devil in your life by pulling down 25 different types of strongholds with 100 different names for those spirits. I don't live in that world because I serve the Lord Jesus Christ who has defeated every spirit. Amen. Amen. And we walk with him. So not with a lot of energy. I just say I bind that spirit of witchcraft that's coming in through the... You will not call this storm through the port of Miami in Jesus' name. We all went home that night. We received a phone call from a Nigerian prophet. I wish I could remember his name. You might know him. And he says to us, he says, Man, Kevin and Leslie, I'm passing up your way. I just want you to know I was leaving Miami when I turned. So I was pulling out. I turned and I looked over and I saw a, a large angel standing in Miami. And the angel said, the storm shall not come in through the port of Miami. Amen. And he drove off. You remember the phone call? This is the life of believers. This is our life. 
It's not reserved for just pastors. It's, it's reserved for all of us. But is your home a refuge for the Lord? Is your home an incubator of God's presence? Is your home that place where you go and, and, and you abide in his presence and you give him permission to move and operate and flow in every area of your life? For the house of God is where every incubator should come to the hospital to produce more life. But the incubator should be at home, working, functioning, growing, creating life. Amen. Amen. So Brother Hagen would get up there and he'd say, now let's pray in other tongues. And I would, I would literally, you probably, if you came in there, I was so naive. I mean, I was just such a Baptist baby at, 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 a, at a full gospel tongue praying institute. You know, <laughs> and you know, my mother told me when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, she said to me, she said, Leslie, you know that lady? They used to work in my office. And she told her, me her name. I said, yeah. She said she'd be up on Monday. Come Wednesday, the world was falling apart. Thursday would be great. Friday, she was out of it again. And then she'd get to go to church on Sunday. She said, you know that woman? I said, yeah. She said, she speaks in tongues. <laughs> I said, Mama. Do you think just because I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I took my brain out and set it on a shelf? I am your daughter. But it's a gift given by God. So Brother Hagen would be up here. And I learned this. And this is what you can learn if you'll learn how to pull in prayer with your pastor and your leaders. I learned as he would, one day he, I, I would cover my ears I would, I would kneel down, put my head into the chair, and cover my ears so I could not hear him. Like if he said, we're going to enter into praying in tongues right now. I didn't want to hear how he was praying. I wanted the Holy Ghost to pray through me. I would take my hands off my ears occasionally, and I was in cadence every step of the way. Cadence. There was a, a rhythm. There was a rhyme. There was a place in the Spirit where we were flowing together. I remember one day in particular when I took my hands off my, I had a vision. I was in the White House. At that time, Reagan was president, so that tells you how long ago that was. I had a vision, and I'm walking in the White House, and I knew that he was going to dismiss. There was strife in the White House, and there would be a dismissal in the White House. Brother Hagen, right at that moment, stood up, and he said, I've just had a vision. I've been in the White House, and this is going to happen. <gasps> I didn't dream it. It really happened. What does this mean for us? Yes, I understand that God gives prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists, but all of these giftings that flow out of all of those offices are in the one whom we call the great shepherd. And the great shepherd's name is Jesus, and he's alive in us. And when he has need of prophecy, he can pull it forth. When he has need of prayer, he can pull it forth. When he has need of healing, but we have to respond to orders from headquarters to fulfill all that God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. What is a witness for Jesus Christ? Who is a missionary? Every believer is a witness for Jesus Christ and every believer is a missionary. Beginning in Jerusalem, which is your own backyard, into Judea, Samaria, and then if you'll walk through those, go on to the outermost parts of the earth and allow him to use you. <coughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I've got 10 pages of stories and I got this feeling I'm out of time. So... So much. Oh. Five more minutes? So much for us to know as believers. Not know. Mm -mm. Knowledge. You know the interesting thing about the former Soviet Union when we went there? Some of the greatest discoveries have been in that nation. But, but with knowledge, no wisdom for application. So it's not the knowledge, unfortunately, I think, not in this church, of course, 
But American Christians have become fat in their learning and fat in their daily lives. Fat, 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 fat. How do you get thin? Work, work, exercise. Hey, fat Christians, full of God. You know more than your pastor knows. You know more than the leaders know. You know more than the evangelists know. You know more than everybody who's on television knows because you know. Fat, fat, fat. Get out there and exercise. Work it off. Work it out. Work it through. Let it flow. And then guess what? You're going to have to put some more meat on those bones. You're going to come running back. I'll close with this story. Right after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, I began to tell you I would get those 50-cent books. And, man, this new thing I was experiencing was, wow, you know, this is great. I think I tried some type of dope once. And when I, just a little tiny bit, it wasn't anything real serious, but it was enough that I went, because I was in rebellion to God at that time at 17. I put that little bit in, and I went, uh-uh, somebody else wants control of my mind. That ain't happening. And I never did it again. <laughs> it's like, uh-uh, maybe call me a control freak. I don't know, but then I think whatever this is ain't going to control me. <laughs> you know? And I, I, never, I never did that again. But when I found Christ, and, I, and I, I found the release of his spirit. When I met Jesus, oh gosh, there's so many stories, I can't go there. But when I, when I, I got that baptism in the Holy Spirit, that release, that fountain of life. And I just could, I prayed all the time, still pray all the time, love to pray. You know, practice the presence of Jesus. Yes. Just practice his presence. Oh my gosh, that's so difficult. How do you know if you're practicing the presence of Jesus? I better get the 10 step plan on how to practice the presence of Jesus. No. Oh. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. Pray continually with all manner of prayer. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord, practicing or becoming more aware of his presence than you are of your own presence. Woo. Hallelujah. So here in this little church, I was a newly baptized person in the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. And I am closing with this story. And all the young people, they, they went through this season. They wanted everybody to testify. They had a testimony. Testify, testify. So I guess I was telling enough people what was going on in my life. Every Saturday, they were pushing, every Sunday, they were pushing me forward to go give a testimony. And I thought, I don't want to testify anymore. Why doesn't somebody else testify? Well, finally, I came down after testifying one day, and this large group of 20 and 30-year-olds gathered around me, 17, you know, probably that whole age group. And they just looked at me, and they said, wow, you're amazing. And I said, they said, the things that you do. I said, what? You don't do these things? I mean, it was like my heart was crushed. Yeah, I just stood there. I said, I'm just doing what this man said in this book. Believer's authority, name of Jesus. I believe in vision. Some of these books... I said, I'm just doing what I see this man wrote. Aren't you doing it too? No, they said, we wouldn't do that. And you'd say, oh yeah, but you were called to be an evangelist. Do you know that was the farthest thought from my mind at that moment in time? I had no idea what that was. No idea. I was a banker. I was running both ends of the county because I was the new age of banking. We had a different type of training. It was no longer real estate lending. It was real lending, you know? And I'm having lunch with a woman who's a banker in the northern end of the county, going over new procedures, and all of a sudden I can't see her. It's like a gray cloud was between me and her. I'm thinking, windshield wipers, what's going on? You know, I don't know these things, but there's a gray cloud. And then I heard somebody scream on the other side of the restaurant. 
And I'm looking at her, and I can't see her, and I see this gray cloud. And I said to her, I said, I got to pray. I got to pray. She just said, well, pray. I'm thinking, no, no, I got to pray. Here I am in my business attire. I run across the restaurant. I see this man laying there. And I'm thinking, I played softball too. I'm just going to slide right into the middle of him because I got to pray. So I slid right in front of the man. I put a hand on his chest. You know, I'm, I'm telling the people, I got to pray. And they're like ignoring me because the EMTs are there. Everybody's there. And I'm like, I got to pray. And I said, oh. And so I thought, okay, I'll just pray quietly. Oh, Lord in heaven. I bowed this prayer, and I heard these words, rebuke the devil. Rebuke the devil? Never done that before. <laughs> I said, I rebuke you, devil. Not like that. I rebuke you, devil, because I didn't want to make a scene. I was already making a scene. I rebuke you, devil. The man sat up. He coughed, <coughs> and he was in his right mind. And now I got a real serious scenario going on. You know, I wish I could tell you that I was like, you know, the guys in the Bible. Hey, such that I have, I give you in the name of Jesus. Arise now and walk. I just whispered into his ear and I said, uh, you've been healed. They're going to take you to the hospital. And when you get there, you're going to find out you're healed. So just lay calm here. Let them take you and everything will be just fine. I don't know, a month later, I was in that same community walking along the street, and this man starts yelling at me, hey, are you the one? And I'm like, am I the one? <laughs> oh, God, what's happening, you know? <laughs> am I the one? <laughs> he runs across the street, and he tells me, he said, you're the one that prayed for my father. He's the owner of this restaurant. Wow. Five bypasses on his heart. When they took him to the hospital, he had a new heart. The doctors could not explain it. Every individual, a witness, a missionary for Jesus Christ. It is not reserved to a clergy. The clergy is given to you to equip you for the work. To equip you for the work. That's outside those doors. I love this collective of young faces right here. In here is enough power to turn this whole community upside down. And the ones that aren't young, you can do it too. <laughs> we're young eternally on the inside. And then we're in Florida. We got a lot of them that are over the age of 70. <laughs> so they need help too. <laughs> so I must finish now. May I just pray with you briefly right where you are? Father, I thank you for this time. God, we cry. Use us. Use us, God. I ask for every individual who is present here today under the sound of my voice, Father in heaven, that they would have an encounter with you. That tonight as they sleep on their beds, Jesus, you would visit them afresh and anew. Dreams, vision, ideas of how, like Mary and the United States and the world, may be changed. And I say, oh God, here I am. Even after all of these years, use me again. Use me in America. I surrender. Use me in America. And I ask you to use them. Now, Lord... It's not just a prayer. That's a prayer of commitment, Father. That's a prayer of commitment, Father. And so we say this with me. I am ready, I am ready. <laughs> to, answer, to answer, to do, to, do. to, go, to go, to be, to, be. to carry, out carry out his plans. His plans. In Jesus' name.